Well, my first two degrees are in education, and I was a middle school teacher. And I have to tell you that during those years, I don't think I ever made it through the evening news. Um, <laughs> you are my heroes. <laughs> Um, I was a little late on my materials, and there is a handout of this presentation so that you can get each, each of the slides in print if you choose to do so. And I think it's on the table over there. Um, I, oh, she's going to pass them out? Okay. Okay, that's great. That's great. What I'm going to do today is to talk a little bit um, in teacher language. And for those of you who are principals out there, I'm going to talk about curricular mandates. And I'm going to try to give you the language and the concepts that will allow this stuff to live uh, against the requirements that you are up against as teachers who have to deliver certain kinds of content and instruction. And I'll try to put a little bit of a face on it in terms of integrating it into various disciplines in the classroom. So the issues that I want to cover are what is design-based education, and you've gotten a, a somewhat of a feel of it uh, from both Ellen and Anna's presentations. I want to talk about how it's aligned with national and local mandates and the goals of educational reform, because you have a great opportunity here to actually do something different. <laughs> To, to kind of make practical uh, the kinds of things that often get talked about in a very lofty way as goals, but never really give you a delivery system for getting those goals accomplished. And then what is the evidence that we have that it succeeds in ways that matter to the constituents for K-12 education? How do you argue for this with the people that are in the testing culture, people who are in uh, the PTA and want to know what's happening with their kids. How do you build that case? And what is the language that's necessary to build that case? I'd like to make a, a, a point, first of all. We're not talking about the pre-professional education of designers. There's a lot of work that goes on between professional associations and schools to look at how do we track kids into the profession of design, the kind of career counseling that goes on. And what I'm talking about today and what you've heard about uh, through the previous speakers is how can design help every kid in the school, not just those kids who want to become design professionals. And in the National Endowment Study, we found that there were a number of ways in which um, teachers were using design in their classroom in that non-professional education. First of all, as reflective study of design objects to understand these larger concepts or um, ideas that are important to everybody to understand and also uh, part of these curricular mandates. So when Ellen's talking to you about um, laundry, she's not really talking about laundry, she's talking about a larger kind of cultural milieu in which design objects must function. They're part of that larger cultural system. And we can understand that cultural system coming through those objects. The active uh, participation of students in the design process is a strategy for solving problems. And we'll talk a little bit in a minute about how that problem solving strategy has become of a concern to um, contemporary life. And then as a pedagogical strategy for teaching curricular content other than design. We have um, decades and centuries of teaching design at the college level and the outcomes of a design education map almost exactly to the kinds of outcomes that we expect of education in general for students who are going to live their lives in the 21st century. So we'll talk a little bit about how that fit is there. Um, first of all, there's some characteristics to design-based problems and design-based education that um, are quite particular. And I think it's important to talk about this because you've heard about project-based education and you've heard about um, activity as a way of teaching. And oftentimes when we do this work, uh, people say, well, that's just good teaching. Well, there are some particular things that design-based education does that other um, active project-based forms may not do. First of all, design activities are open-ended. We don't know what the answer is before we begin. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have outcomes you want to achieve. But every student in the class is not doing the same thing with the goal of producing the same object at the end. And oftentimes, there are exercises 
that go on in classrooms in which the teacher knows exactly what that outcome is to look like and all of the students are working towards the same goal. Um, not the case in design. And it's important to understand that because if you don't know what the thing looks like, you don't have to be the authority in the room. You can be the facilitator. Uh, the student is going to get to that answer. Design activities are situated. They happen in a context. And you can take uh, information from that context. One of the things that we find when, when we go into classrooms to do this work is the kids are surprised about how much they already know about something. That they don't have to sit down and learn something before they can actually do something. And the situated uh, nature of design, I think, really helps that. Design activities are responsive, um, and kids are accountable to more than their own criteria for success. And so the issue of the can opener, um, who has to use that, determines what the performance criteria are for judging whether it's a good design or not a good design. And oftentimes, especially with teenagers, it's difficult to say that there is a world that is not 15 years old and that they have other wants and needs besides the ones that you have. It's values driven. Very often we see these things as requiring that we rank order or place greater emphasis on certain aspects of the problem than on other aspects. And that, that kind of testing of values in conflict is something that we want young people to know and it gives us an opportunity to do that. And then it's authentic in its assessment. The criteria are negotiated and public in the classroom. And so when you begin a design problem, you're asking students to think about what are the things we're going to use to judge this and to collectively make those decisions. And then to look for the work and critique the work against those. There was a study done in universities about the uh, number of ways in which people are assessed. And they found that the design critique in which a group of students sit around and talk about the objects and discuss those in relationship to a problem statement that they were working against actually creates a situation in which they know what their next move will be after failure. And when they were taking objective tests to fill in the blank, they knew they got things wrong, but they didn't know how to correct or to alter the process that took them to that failure in the first place. And the critique really opens that up. So here's an example. Here are four cups. Uh, the one on the top here is a, a driving mug. It's stable and retains heat. Why is it stable and retains heat? Okay. Okay. So shape is wide at the base, and it's made of ceramics. Okay. So that that has a particular set of characteristics in it that we can say all other things that cup could have been have been suppressed for those two particular characteristics: stable and retains heat. The red and white ones stacked here are Heller mugs designed by Massimo Vignelli. There's a slight bevel in the bottom that allows one to sit in the next. And look at the handle. Um, it's convex where the hand is concave and, and concave where the hand is convex. So it's very anthropomorphic. Um, there's a story, uh, Vignelli was asked uh, because there was a little scoop taken out of the, the handle there where it met the bowl of the, the cup uh, and it was causing coffee to run down people's arms when they tipped their hand and so Heller had him come back in and fill in that little space and he uh, in a true Italian sense said that Americans just didn't know how to drink coffee. <laughs> the teacup there is my grandmother's teacup. What's the gesture of that teacup? Okay. Yes. I can't get my finger through that. There's nothing about that handle that is designed for my finger to pass through it. And it's fussy with all these little flowers. It's got a small base, not very stable. It's wide at the top, opens the surface of the liquid to loss of heat. And so we sacrifice those kinds of functional things because there's something socially important about having this teacup. And this has, in fact, been passed down through my family. It's, a, it's a, an item of heritage as much as it is an item of function. And there's not too many things in our lives anymore that we would pass on. Think about what you own that you would pass on. Yeah. And then we have a Dixie cup. Okay. 
tipsy when it's not filled with something. It's got these ridges around it so that when it sweats, you can kind of hang on to it for cold liquids. And we throw it away when we're finished. It's disposable. So the design problem here is to design a fifth cup that is either stackable and retains heat or elegant and disposable. So what we've, we've done in the design problem is to put two competing priorities in competition. Now this is a test um, that we developed for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, what you've often heard of as the nation's report card. And it went through the Educational Testing Service and it went to the arts people and they said that's science. And it went to the science people and they said that's art. And it actually wound up on the test, but, but I think that's the place that design often occupies. And it's that very interdisciplinary nature that gives it the flexibility to move so easily through the cur curriculum as a way of teaching a variety of subject areas. So this question of how is design-based education aligned with national or local mandates and the goals of educational reform? And we're going to look at a couple of um, important things here. One is called the Secretary's Commission for Achieving Necessary Skills. That's the Secretary of the Department of Labor. We're going to talk a little bit about the level at which 20th century problems exist and then something called the National Voluntary Content Standards, which are probably the basis of your local standards. Uh, this is a project begun um, in the year, well, actually, it probably came to fruition in the year 2001, and was an attempt to define what every young American should know and be able to do in a, in a range of subject areas. So here's the SCANS report. Um, the Department of Labor in 1992 brought together industry leaders and said, what do we need in a competent, productive works, workforce in the 21st century? With an eye to how the 21st century was very different from the 20th century. And they came up with competencies, thinking skills, and personal qualities. And I'd like to focus mostly on the competencies and thinking skills, although Evidence shows that design actually produces the personal qualities very frequently as well. Look at the thinking skills. Creative thinking, decision making, and problem solving. It's very interesting to see all three of those called out. They're not lumped together. Which says that not only do we want people to be able to solve problems, but we want them to do that in an innovative way. We want them to think about things um, in a way that is different from the way we have been doing things. And then we want them to have the follow through, the action that comes from making decisions. Seeing things in the mind's eye, being able to imagine things visually, spatially, before you actually f proceed on them. Um, very strange thing coming out of the Department of Labor. <laughs> you know, I think it's absolutely revolutionary. Uh, knowing how to, how to learn. This is an acceptance that we cannot cram all the known facts into kids' heads. That it's not about facts. It's about knowing how to learn. That over a career that is probably going to be 50 years for most of these kids, that what they need to know is going to change. So what they really need is to ha knowing how to learn, how to acquire that information in a flexible way, and then reasoning. Then over on the left here, we have use of resources, use of information, interpersonal skills, using systems, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and using technology. So this concept of use, how do you put these things together? Now, notice that none of the information on this list is discipline specific. And the real task for, for kids is the enterprise of applied learning. It's about figuring out how all that stuff that we have hardened into categories, into silos, comes together in applied learning. And that's what design does very well. Next, we have to start thinking about the level at which we focus the attention of students and also the attention of adults. And you can think of a series of problems that exist at different levels but are related. So I'm going to take you through a, a sequence here. Um, and I want you to think about them in terms of, of the issues of transportation. I could design um, a wagon wheel 
And that wagon wheel is a component of a much larger object called a wagon. And that wagon wheel could have all kinds of variations in it that I would have to test out. How many spokes? Is it spokes? Is there an axle relationship to the wheel? All of that is important for me to understand. I could design the product. I could be concerned about things at the scale of the wagon itself. I could design the system, which is what is the wagon in relationship to all other transportation systems. Or I could understand that the transportation system interfaces with other things. For example, uh, the automobile is designed largely as a product. But it interfaces with, with a whole range of other systems, cultural systems. You know, what you own and what you drive is often an expression of who you think you are. We have neighborhoods that are divided by off-ramps that are geographically close, but people don't know each other because of the off-ramp. We have pollution problems because of the commitment to the internal combustion engine. So, so it's very difficult in contemporary society to only think about designing at the product and component level. Everything is connected. All of us talk about sustainability. We can't be sustainable unless we understand the concept of a system. There was a poll recently of designers asking what they thought most of the research needed to be in design. And the top choice was sustainability. The bottom choice was systems theory. You can't be sustainable if you don't understand a system. And so what we've got to do is think about how do we acquaint students with this notion of a system when we still have these responsibilities to teach very, very discrete topics that are oftentimes very much at the component and product level. The National Voluntary Standards um, attempt to define what every young American should know and be able to do with respect to 12 subject areas. And the national or new performance standards, which is a project coming out of the University of Pittsburgh, asks the question, how good is good enough in relationship to those concepts? And as an exercise, I went into um, not only the descriptions of those actual uh, standards, but also the work that preceded the standards. For example, this is Project 2061, Benchmarks for Science Literacy. Do we have science teachers in here? OK. Um, and I looked for standards that I thought were either referencing design in, in specific terms or related to design. And I actually found more standards related to design in science, geography, social studies, civics, um, and language arts than I found in the arts standards. And the study the National Endowment did of, we had a nomination pool of about 900 teachers. We selected 169 for the case studies that you see in Design as a Catalyst for Learning. Only two of those were art teachers. So, so the expertise out there seems to show that the teachers in these other subject areas are very good at integrating design and actually teaching design uh, within the context of their subjects. So I've, I've lifted text from those standards. I haven't changed any of the words. Uh, now, in one case, I've collapsed in, uh, uh, several standard um, areas. But these are how they're actually phrased in the national standards. Science, studying how the designed world works. Gaining direct experience with materials and forces through design activity. Analyzing products and environments. Identifying the problems they solve developing design solutions to complex problems and probing constraints. In other words, science standards actually mandate that you teach design. And how you deliver that is still within your ballpark, but they're asking for design content in the, in the science standards. Here's an example of a project we did with a classroom. We had all of the kids in the room take off one shoe, turn it over and look at the tread. And we had them line up on a continuum from what they expected to be the, one, the shoe with the least traction to the shoe with the most traction. And of course, the most expensive athletic shoes were at the most traction end. They equated um, popularity and money with traction. Um, we then took a five-foot board, 
drew a line across the middle of it, put the toe of the shoe at the line, and raised the back of the board until the toe broke the, the, the line. When it started to slide, we recorded how high was the board in the back. That gave us a number for every shoe. And then we rearranged those shoes on the continuum for actual traction as opposed to predicted traction. Now this allows the science teacher to talk about the issues of work, of energy, of friction, of traction, whatever the terms are that are being used in the curriculum. And we found, of course, that you know, the cheaper shoe actually had more traction, you know, which was a good lesson in consumerism. Um, we then asked them to design traction or tread uh, for maximum traction on shoes for various activities. Uh, if you're moving in running, you're going forward. If you're playing tennis, you're moving back and forth. And so beginning to anticipate what kind of movement would cause you to want a certain kind of tread design. And by the way, there are some wonderful um, websites out there. If you just Google um, running shoes and education, you will find all kinds of activities that have been built around this notion of traction. Here's another one, and this uses a, a strategy that uh, I have a group of students working on right now. Um, it's the fish taxi. <laughs> Design a way to transport a live goldfish from the pet store to your home while riding your bicycle with both hands and you can't use a plastic bag. <laughs> okay. Now what a scenario does is it has embedded in it a script for action. And it's surprising how many students um, uh, are surprised by the information they already know on this problem. This one also appeared on the national assessment and uh, when we designed it, we were testing uh, with 18,000 students how well they did in it and we had to train some people to score this thing and one of the scorers came back in and said, here's a really good one. The student decided to put the fish in a helium balloon and put it on the front of the bicycle. Well, any of you who teach science or who are moderately familiar with the forces of nature, that fish isn't going to live. <laughs> so this is a case of teaching the scorers not to get overly charmed by the student solution and to go back into something that really made sense. And you can talk about you know, all of these experiences that have to do with riding a bike and a goldfish. And what the scenario does is bring forward those experiences. And the students have had those experiences and can understand that. One of the studies that we're doing is, is how, how fantastic can we make this scenario? Um, in other words, is building a colony on Mars too far a stretch? Uh, to understand and be able to take information from it, but it's certainly possible. Social studies, geography, and civic standards. Here we've got uh, considering how economy, culture, and technology shape design responses. Using and interpreting graphic communication techniques, understanding the spatial organization of people, places, and environments, understanding how human actions modify the physical environment, discerning the interdependence of the built and natural world in spatial dimensions, and analyzing the structures of cities and predicting the impact of change. This is architecture and urban planning. And what a wonderful way to, to get students into these concepts that are already required by these curricula. Here's an example. Um, what we've got here is a little town and that town has to make a decision about the location of a city park. And it has some options. Um, the yellow squares over here on the left represent the West uh, End Neighborhood Association with 60% of the population in this town. And they want that park to be between a, a, a freeway and a river and near to their location. The second site on the right is from the East End Neighborhood Association. These are the fat cats who uh, pay 60% of the taxes and they want it next to a hospital. And these are mostly older families while the West End Neighborhood Association has younger families. And then the school board represents advocates for an outdoor environmental education program and they want it right next to the school. But the school isn't where anyone lives. So they are, the students are divided into these three groups. A fourth group plays the town council, 
and the students have to put together an argument um, for the particular location that will be selected by the town council. And then they have to design the park uh, in consideration of what they think the liabilities of that location will be that will be identified by the other group. So how do you overcome being um, next to a river and having people cross the freeway to get there? How do you overcome uh, loud activities next to a hospital? Um, so these students role play these situations and over a period of um, several class periods begin to build this, um, this idea. We had a teacher in the workshop do a wonderful uh, takeoff on this in which uh, they, they were required to teach that every North Carolina citizen in colonial times had to devote four days a year to building roads. That was the textbook lesson. And so they showed uh, three possible paths for that extension to take place, one to small farmers, one to the marketplace, and one to a plantation. And the plantation location was slightly too far away to solve the problem in four days, um, and yet necessary to get the goods to the river and the dock uh, to go off to the marketplace. And the students understood through this activity that the only way the plantation owner could get what he wanted was to use slaves. What a realization for a group of African American kids in a middle school understanding that motive. And the conversations that came out of that were so much more powerful than simply reading in the book, everybody has to build roads four days a year. It was a way to get into a very delicate conversation, and it came through that role-playing activity. Here's a case of using a design artifact as a way to talk about history. Uh, what we have here is Thomas Jefferson's design for the uh, state capital of Virginia. And Jefferson based that on a second century Roman Republic uh, building called the Maison Carré. Why would he choose the Roman Republic? Right, it's his model for democracy, not Greek. <laughs> and in fact, when Jefferson designed the University of Virginia campus, anybody been there at all, the Quad? Um, it's, a, it's a, actually an encyclopedia for architecture. It has the Roman Pantheon, which was the library at the head of the uh, the lawn and surrounding it were 10 architectural examples from history because Jefferson's University taught architecture at that time. There were no British examples. <laughs> so here we have architecture expressing a value system and the students can access that value system through the building. Also this building divides the executive, legislative, and judicial branches in three different parts of the building so that you begin to see the separation of powers expressed in the architecture. This is a task. I sent uh, some students to the J. Walter Thompson advertising collection at Duke University and there are a lot of these collections around the country and I would imagine um, you can find some of them relatively close. And I asked them to find a product that had been advertised for at least 30 years. And they came back with Listerine. Now these are not high design objects by any means. But when we arranged things chronologically, we started to see particular patterns. And on the left, you see something from the 1930s. It says, I got them whisk broom blues. Um, and we've got this porter actually playing with the whisk broom. And his lament is bad breath. In the middle, you see something from the 50s and early 60s, separate but equal. So the same ad reappears in a, in a kind of new guise, but of course the African-American woman has to look like the white woman in terms of hairstyle. And then you see the 70s, after the civil rights movement. And these become expressions of social attitude. We did the same thing with women. And Listerine actually had a problem. It blamed women for the demise of all relationships because of bad breath. And they finally revolted in the 1950s and said, we can't take it anymore. 
And, um, but, but beginning to look at those objects and looking for patterns in that object, we can, we can start to see some ways in which design reflects a social condition. English language arts standards. And here, um, you, you need to understand that non-print in these terms means visual. Presenting clear and convincing arguments, gathering, evaluating, and synthesizing information in non-print text. Exploring the complexity and creative potential of problem solving, presenting stories and information in non-print media. Extracting information from maps, charts, photos, and other graphics. And using forms of visual representation and persuasive arguments. The concept of modeling and diagramming in schools is not very well understood, and software now will let you put absolutely anything into a pie chart, whether it should be in a pie chart or not. So how do we get kids to be critical about the issue of form in terms of models and diagrams? In modeling, the traditional uh, practice is for kids to replicate the phys physical characteristics of something. So they build the globe theater, and they're all caught up in making the thatched roof on the globe theater. And very frequently, it's the kid who's really good at thatching that winds up doing it, and the rest of them all sit around and watch that really good kid make thatched roofs. What they never get out of that experience is the relationship between performer and audience that is set up by that piece of architecture because they're so busy trying to replicate the physical conditions. So on the left, you see an exercise that we've done um, using newspaper. And we'll ask them to model some abstract concept, change in the American family since 1900. How do you model change? The newspaper is such a lousy material. There are no better or worse paper crumblers. You know, the, it evens the playing field for all kids. And they can't make anything that looks like anything. But what it does is allow them to understand the relationships among parts, to begin to understand a language of diagramming, how far away I put something from something else, how big one thing is in relationship to another. And the conversation um, gives you a way of understanding what a kid knows about a concept without them having to write it. And in public schools, what we do is we hold all information captive by writing. And if the kid can't write it, or he can't check the right box after reading on a test, he doesn't have any way of telling you what he knows and is able to do with respect to the subject matter if he's not a good writer or reader. Now, it's not to say that those aren't important things, but sometimes it helps knowing that they get the concept, they just can't get the writing right. And so the conversations you can eavesdrop on in this, in this particular kind of modeling activity are absolutely amazing. And small kids, uh, very young kids, can, can start to build models and diagrams in ways that are great beginnings to other kinds of activities, even writing activities. You know, they're so much better to, on writing on the topic after they understand the nature of the relationships. The other thing this is better matched to, when I learned uh, to write in schools, it was, you know, outline, Roman numeral one, A, B, C, Roman numeral two, A, B, C. Well, we're in a hypermedia world, and every object or discussion has multiple relationships to other things. If you're on the web, there's no guarantee that anybody's going to read the thing you wrote in the order that you wrote it. And so how we teach students to understand this kind of spatial organization of information is really, really critical. And lastly, more and more information is coming visually. We have very few people who are getting their primary information through reading on the news anymore. Newspaper readership is something like 17%. And if you pick up USA Today, you're probably as much a looker as you are a reader. <laughs> So being critical about the visual arrangement of things and learning to articulate through that is a really important skill. Here's another activity we've done. Um, these, are, um, these happen to be sixth graders in this particular situation. And we give them a piece of cardboard. Everybody gets the same size piece of cardboard. 
um, a bag of blocks that are made up of cylinders and cubes and triangles and pyramids and things of that sort, all identical. And uh, a note card with a building type. So it might say church or factory or farm or gas station or whatever. And we ask them to build the building type on that plot of land, which is what the card is for. And then they go around and try to guess what each of their peers has built. And they leave little notes behind saying, I think this is a farm. I think this is a factory. Um, what, what this gets at is that there's a language to the built environment that is culturally determined. There's something about one factory that has characteristics that look like another factory. And that learning to speak that language um, is helpful in navigating a very complex built world. Now this was an interesting exercise. We did it with a group of, of gifted and talented kids in an English class and a group of kids that were labeled at risk in a social studies class. The gifted and talented kids were very upset after it was over. They wanted to get it right. They would not leave the classroom. Uh, they wanted to rebuild because they knew now how to do it right. The um, high risk kids had been wrong so many times that there was nothing uh, holding them back from building what they thought they needed to build and then talking about what happened with it. And we actually had much better success with that. And we found through the NEA study that frequently these activities are activities that work very well with kids who struggle with the traditional uh, delivery system in schools. And so if you're, if you're working with a group um, that, that has those traditional problems, a lot of it coming through having to go through reading and writing as the way to talk about any field, um, this works. And it also tells us something about what we're doing with gifted and talented. Um, then what is the evidence that this actually works? What do we know and what can we report about that? Well, the, the National Endowment for the Arts commissioned this study. It was published in January of 1998. Um, it's the book you have here. We, we opened a hotline for three months, asked for teacher nominations, got those, opened up some dialogue with each of the nominees, and selected ultimately 169 case studies. And that's what the book covers. We found that. Um, that the use of design in classrooms enhances students' flexible thinking skills, promotes self-directed learning and assessment, develops interpersonal and communication skills, cultivates responsible citizens. Let me talk a little bit about that. We had one group, for example, of kids who adopted a 12 square block area um, in their neighborhood that was covered with a lot of trash. Those kids did some research found it was a terminal end to the original Oregon Trail, wrote a $17,000 grant to the Army Corps of Engineers to clean up the block, polled uh, people in the area about its relationship to the business community, developed a newsletter that had a subscription of 24,000 people in the area, and each year, the fourth grade passes that on to the next fourth grade. Those were fourth graders that did that. And the city no longer makes any decisions about that 12 block area without consulting the fourth grade. <laughs> um, th this is very powerful stuff about getting into your neighborhoods and thinking about how do you teach kids to, to take control, to understand that they're active, uh, decision makers, whether they're professionals in that particular discipline or not. And there's many, many case studies in here of that kind of work. Saving historic buildings, you know, uh, mobilizing groups of people to do something that socially um, needs to happen in a community. Reaching all learner types and making learning active. The teacher moves from authority to facilitator. Now this is a front end transformation of teachers that um, probably is the toughest thing to accomplish. Uh, you're used to knowing what you teach. 
And uh, I, I would say that in almost all cases, people had to be convinced that they could make this transition. But um, over and over again, we hear about the lack of disciplinary problems in the classroom when kids are motivated. I watched one kid with the, uh, the study of the road building and slavery. I went in and observed the class for two days before they started the activity. And there was one little guy who would get up, walk in front of the teacher, go over and sharpen his pencil, walk back in front of the teacher, then go back again and get a tissue off the teacher's desk. He was doing everything possible to distract that classroom while the teacher was teaching. We put him in charge of his group, and he was so on task. You know, he was the guy. He was the plantation owner. <laughs> and um, it, was, it was a transformation to watch him all of a sudden take all that energy that had been used negatively and move it positively. And that happens over and over again in these discussions with teachers. And then builds connections among teachers subject to areas and community. It is very easy to have an integrated learning experience around the design activity. In one of the schools we worked in, we actually went in because they had teacher teams working together. And it was simple for them to move things across disciplines because design was so flexible in doing that. For those of you who feel burdened by testing, um, here's some results that come from a class in Pomona, California. This class, I think, has uh, probably 20 students in it. 14 of them are um, new Americans. So their language skills are not terribly high. Um, she taught this in her classroom when no one else in the school was doing this. And today, she actually runs uh, the entire teacher curriculum development operation for the school. The school has converted to this, and she's about to become the principal of a new charter school with Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. So, so here's a case of somebody who started with no support uh, and was able to kind of leverage that over and over again to get these kinds of statistics. So I, I guess the end note here is it is possible to do this within a testing and, and counting culture. And it is possible to do this with some upfront work that yields great benefits after uh, you get it established in a school. And it's also possible to make compelling arguments to administrators. Uh, we did find that the most successful places were places where the administrator was not just patting people on the back and saying, good job, but actually engaged in the process of developing this as a culture. And uh, the great thing that you've got going here is that you're all here. <laughs> um, you've got colleagues who would share this, this experience and be able to do this um, with supporting each other. So questions? I see an arm back there. Uh -huh. I know what actually works. How, how large can you expand the class to uh, um, to use this type of uh, project-based learning? Well, this, this particular class that you're looking here was about 20 kids. Um, let, me, let me describe what this classroom looks like. It's pretty amazing. She has four, uh, four by eight sheets of plywood on top of which have been built topography. It's built out of styrofoam. All the desks are pushed to the side of the room. The kids don't sit in the desks. And they, build th they go to these various land masses. Each of the land masses has a different characteristic. One's a desert, one's mountains, one's a river basin. And she teaches everything around those land masses. Now, this is a commitment to, to a particular object and all the way across the curriculum that maybe many of you are not prepared to do. But she was. Um, they work on the problem of that land mass. Okay, If, if this is a... a a riverbed area, how are we going to produce industry here? How are we going to govern that landmass? By the end of the course, they find out that it's China, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. They back into it. There's a period of time where they put a grid over top of that landmass, and they start selling plots of land. And how are we going to calculate how big that plot of land is? And they learn how to do an algebraic equation, and they learn geometry. Okay, I've plotted that land. It's okay if I stay in a square. What if I want an angle? 
on that property. That's just not going to work. Everything's gridded off like graph paper. She teaches entirely through those land masses with 20 kids, 14 of which English is not a first language. So those are not optimal. And she's in a portable building. She's in one of those butler buildings with no windows and crummy floor and you know all, all the things you know about. <laughs> In my situation, I found that the foreign students, even if they were ESL students, were of some benefit mm -hmm. to, to be able to, you know, motivated to learn. Um, if, if that is what you did in one sixth grade classroom, and now this person is going to be uh, directing a whole school, what's going to happen with the whole school? Well, they're working out what the curriculum should be at each level, and, and there's a larger principle here than just the land masses. The land mass was her way of getting at it, um, but they're going to build that. Uh, there's a school in the book that, as you're reading through it, uh, look at that one very carefully. It's called Willamette Primary School, and it's a case where um, all of the teachers are concurrently working on graduate degrees in design-based work and they meet together for an hour each day at the end of the classroom and so the entire school is moving in that direction so uh, one of the things that came out of that one the kids wanted uh, they had a python and they wanted the python to stay in the classroom and so they had to design a way to keep the python in the classroom they had to design its cage they had to figure out you know what the dimensions of that needed to be they had to cost it out they had to present to the principal and the faculty what that was going to be, how they were going to maintain this um, across many years. Um, they essentially did what somebody in commerce would have to do who wanted to achieve something. And um, that's an attitude that moves through every, every aspect of the curriculum in that school. Um, that's another case where the curriculum, the teacher became the curriculum specialist, then she became the principal, the principal became the superintendent, and the superintendent has now taken it to the full level of all, all primary schools. And are all the schools, all the classroom settings, approximately 20 students between? Uh, I, don't know the, I don't know what the size of that particular school system is. But um, all of those, the teachers I'm mentioning are still there. And in the Willamette case, you could actually track them down and have a conversation with them. And the contact information is in the back of the book. I know that you have designed national standards. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have uh, standards that will be effective for each individual state, or is just one national? The national voluntary standards. By the way, there's a great book that comes out of the Association for Supervision and, and Curriculum T Development called Content Knowledge, and it is a summary of all 12 subject areas, the national standards. And these have been <coughs> prepared by experts in each area. Um, I think those are the basis of most state standards and you could look at your own to see if they've replicated those. Um, I don't know about particular states. I don't know Louisiana well enough. Um, uh, I know that there are states, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan in particular, that have adopted specific design standards. But the, the general curricular standards, I think, are mostly based on the national standards. And you can get those easily through that, that single book. Um, sorry. Just to add to that, one of the things that um, the Smithsonian will be, is doing a, is working on the technology so that any design-based lesson plans that are on our site automatically go through. Um, there's a system where you can click and either get them on national or the local level. It automatically translates. So um, anything that will be on our site will also link to, well, you'll be able to drill down to the local and get yeah. that. And in the same way, when you guys write your own lesson plans to national standards, teachers across the country will be able to work on, the, use the same program to get their own local mm -hmm. standards out of it. Mm -hmm. So it'll make Great. things a little easier. I was also going to suggest, um, given all the teachers you mentioned who are working on this, maybe one of the things we should do is invite them to participate in our online discussions in our ERC, the Educator Resource Center that you'll see on Friday, and maybe we can facilitate some, um, some yeah. conversations where you guys can ask some of them very specific questions. Mm -hmm. That's great. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you.